What does the film against other pros say about the Jazz's newest members? Find out next on Locked On Jazz. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into another week's edition of Locked On Jazz. It's post the draft. Uh, it's still going to be draft related because we have some new players on the Utah Jazz. I'm Leif Tulin with you again this week, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to fill in for David Locke for just a little bit longer and talk with you guys. You guys know me now, but I'm a lifelong Jazz fan, credentialed NBA draft analyst, a college basketball lover, statistician for the Utah Jazz. So don't expect all the geeky numbers of usual to be gone. I got a couple fun ones here for you today. And just someone that is excited to see the Jazz navigate and inform you guys how the Jazz may approach navigating through a critical juncture in franchise history. We, we know who the three players are that they drafted and now what's ahead for the Utah Jazz. Thanks for making Locked On Jazz your very first listen every day. And remember, Locked On Jazz is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube at Locked On Jazz, where the best way to help us grow is comment anything below. And today's question is, have you watched any of these players play full games? And if so, which game was the most impressive? In the first segment today, I'll discuss what Taylor Hendricks and Justin Zanuck said after the Jazz selected Hendricks and talk about what I observed from his matchup against Jairus Walker, who went a pick higher than him. Out of Houston, Jairus Walker is heading to the Pacers. And I'll talk about what I observed from that matchup. I've watched that them play twice in the regular season. I watched them live both times, or live in terms of on my TV both times. And I rewatched both those matchups, and I'll tell you my observations from it. In the second segment, I will tell you about some comments made by Keontae George and Justin Zanuck on Keontae George and his potential fit with the Jazz. And what I observed from watching him play against Anthony Black as well as Jordan Walsh of Arkansas. And th that's a really good one. I watched that game in in full again, and I watched that one live as well. And I came away even more impressed this time than I did the first time. And in the final segment, I'll talk about Bryce Sensabaugh, what Zanuck said about him, and mention some observations I made while watching him play against Penn State, against Seth Lundy of Penn State, who was selected 46th, and, but was regarded as a very good all-Big Ten caliber defender. And I, if in case you're wondering why I didn't choose him against Jet Howard, it's because they didn't guard each other. So I wanted to make sure that the top players in each game were guarding each other. All right, let's dive right in. Taylor Hendricks. The more I thought about him, the more potential I see, which was my biggest knock. And and maybe it's just me talking about like, oh, now I'm optimistic because that's who the Jazz have. I am an optimistic person, so that could be part of it. But here's why. Hendricks could easily, in a few years' time, be a plus shooter, a plus athlete. And he, he is a really, really good athlete. Watching some more of his film, he, I, you don't gain an appreciation from it because of his stat shooting. But you watch him run and transition. He's 95th percentile, and he looks it. Like, he he really runs like a deer, and he jumps. And I, I think the most impressive thing I saw from him was I watched a block compilation of him today on Twitter, and they're, like, trying to dunk on him, and he palms the ball out of their hands. It's incredible. But anyway, he could be a plus shooter, plus athlete, and a plus defender playing a crucial and critical coveted role in the NBA. I could see him scoring 17-7 and doing so efficiently and being good on defense. And then looking through redrafts, I, I it's a hobby of mine. I like to look through redrafts and say, well, I mean, what what would these numbers do? So I started, I said, what if he scored 17-7, was good on defense, played a critical position? That yields top seven production value in just about every draft. And if you get top seven value out of the ninth pick, that's a win. I think it's very possible. And perhaps I undersold what upside means. Upside typically gets uh, tied in with like someone being raw. But Hendricks had a high floor. But his upside could be just that. It's not a superstar. 17-7 doesn't typically get you all-star consideration. But how many drafts have seven all-stars? How many drafts have nine all-stars? Not very many. So here are some numbers I found and then a, and a quote I stumbled across. The number of players six foot nine or taller who enter the league as plus defenders, plus, shoot, plus shooters is extremely minimal. It's Jabari Smith Jr., Franz Wagner, Trey Murphy, Jaron Jackson Jr. since 2018. And you can make an argument that Franz Wagner wasn't regarded as a great shooter. I know his percentage was about 38%, which is similar to Hendricks. But Wagner's main question mark about him was uh, how well is, is he going to shoot? off the ball in the NBA. Well, he, he's he's done very well. But yeah, that, that's a select bunch, and all of them are very successful. That's why Hendricks is going to hear, and this is the rest of the quote, that's why Hendricks is going to hear his name called in the lottery. It's hard to see how this skill set fails. Even with his faults, he does the three most important things a player in the NBA can do. He shoots it well off the catch, 
He defends well in space, and he plays well within help defensive concepts. Throw in that, he's still a teenager with real upside, and you shouldn't be surprised if he hears his name called in the top 10. Well, that guy was right. I wish I could get some credit. I saw, I saw this as a blank, anonymous quote. So if you guys see that, I apologize for uh, not giving credit there. But that that's really impressive. Okay, here's what Taylor Hendricks said, what he'll bring to the Jazz. I feel like I'll bring a lot more length to the Jazz, and my shooting ability and my defensive versatility is something that I can bring, Hendricks said of his skill set. I know the Utah Jazz, they like to play big. They like big lineups. They like moving Lowry to the three. I feel like I could fit in, the, in that team really well because they have a lot of length, so I'm going to be right with them. My shooting ability could really help them out as well. So, I mean, he gave his pitch. Three and D, length, size, athleticism. Does it well. Here's a stat for you. He was the only player in the NCAA to hit 60 or more three-pointers, block 55 or more shots, and have 35 or more dunks last year. There's a lot of players, 353 teams, and uh, a lot of big players. Well, he's the only guy that had those type of stats for you. That's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive indeed. As for what I noticed uh, when Hendricks played Jarris Walker, and I watched their game, uh, their second of the two games uh, th- today when I when I was watching film. I didn't watch both of them two times over, but I've watched two one of the games twice and the other one once. So I, I am familiar with this matchup. Uh, Hendricks against Jarris Walker, who I, I was vocal about Jarris being the better target, my preferred target. And I still believe he has a higher upside just because I think he's that special of a defender. And I think he's got more capacity with the ball in his hands. But you watch this game and you can spin the narrative that Hendricks is the better prospect. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at you crazy. I've had this discussion with people on air, off air, and I would have taken Walker, but we'll see. Time will tell. So what did Hendricks do? He spaced the floor and attacked off the bounce using his gravity as a shooter to gain advantages and finished above the rim with, with dunks. And I was impressed with some of the power takes where he finished with layups over the athleticism and length of Houston. For those of you who don't know, Kelvin Sampson's teams are unbelievable rebounding teams, unbelievable defensive teams. Houston was anchored by not only Jarris Walker, but they had veteran bigs and bulldogs as guards, like absolute bulldogs, Jamal Shedd and Marcus Sasser on the perimeter. So Hendricks wasn't necessarily getting easily created looks. He was getting the ball as a shooter with gravity, attacking closeouts, and, and Walker's super strong. He's up nearly 250 pounds, 248 pounds, and Hendricks was going into his chest and elevating over him. Hendricks played great in this game. So Hendricks went 6 of 10 from the field with seven points, uh, with, with 17 points and 7 rebounds. Uh, really good game. Uh, he, you know, Maybe you want a guy to shoot more than 10 shots. Maybe you want him to... Uh, create for himself but he played within the system got to the line once or twice hit his hit a corner three i think he went two of five from three in that uh he he got to the rim he had a dunk he had one where he went straight through the chest of jarris walker and banked it in like a rocket from dead center which not my favorite type of finish in terms of the aesthetics but it was impressive to see the athleticism and strength hendrix is a very good vertical athlete that was my biggest takeaway watching this like you watch all these guys soar above the rim for both teams, and Hendricks is the one that reigns supreme on the balls that were just a sky in the air. He tips the ball. He grabs it. He's very active on both ends. Uh, Walker and other excellent athletes on Houston don't really quite reach the same air at, that Hendricks does, and that really struck me, and I didn't notice that the first time. And his dribbling is his swing skill. We knew that. He, the creation. I've already talked about his lack of creation. Well, it's something like it's it's not as uh his strongest suit but it's it's an easier one to develop if given the chance like Lowry Markkinen is an efficient player I wouldn't say he's a creator of, of shots for himself and that's something he'll improve I think that's a really good thing for the Jazz because now they'll have two players of a similar size and ilk that you want to improve a similar skill set and who better to teach him than Kelly Olynyk? so I expect Olynyk back and so maybe maybe that's something that he'll really gain and have as a value with a mentor like Kelly Olynyk, as opposed to it being a deterrent because he won't start necessarily right away. That that's something interesting to me. I I think the biggest skill uh, thing I noticed in this game, and it, and it's easier to break down the game like Keontae George with the ball in his hands a lot more than what Hendricks did. Uh, the other things I noticed, Hendricks rotationally was very aware. Houston's the better team, so it sometimes you'd say, okay, well Hendricks isn't doing a ton. But he was playing uh, as one of the better players on the floor as a freshman, and the rest of his team was outmatched. And he looked like he belonged, and he was playing a position where he has to be a beneficiary with the ball as opposed to someone who creates for other people. And so it's harder to evaluate that film. But he rebounded well. He slid his feet well defensively. 
Im, uh, impacted shots at the rim. And I was impressed with his finishing ability, which is one of the things that statistically isn't the greatest. And he did it against very good competition. So coming up next, I'll talk about Keontae George, his college game, what, what that says about him and what he will become versus what he was in college. And I think that's really, that's an important distinction. I'll explain what that means coming up next. And let's break down some film against NBA caliber defenders in Anthony Black and Jordan Walsh, both of whom were selected to the Eastern Conference teams in the Magic and the Suns. But first, a message from eBay Motors. When it comes to your vehicle, every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts or parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors with eBay Guaranteed Fit. You can head to eBay Motors. Uh, sorry, you can be sure every part fits just right at eBay Motors the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. And when you shop on eBay Motors with and with 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when all the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only. Available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome back into Locked On Jazz. Alif Tulin here with you, and it's time to do the deep dive on the game of one Keontae George. Let's start out with what Justin Zanuck said about Keontae George. And I think this is an impressive quote. Like, I don't think he's making this up either. Keontae is probably the most diversified offensive skill set, maybe in the draft, Zanuck said of George. Keontae has been doing it for a long time at a very, very high level. He has all the shots, shots that some people can't ever learn. He's worked on his body. He has confidence as a scorer. We've got to work on where, where he fits into the team, but right now he's already an offensive weapon. Then Keontae added, the Jazz are going to get a guy that is going to come in, work hard, be coachable, willing to learn, and each and every day. It's pretty good. George said of what he brings to the team. Of course, my scoring ability, I feel like is one of the best. My creativity with the basketball, I know they're going to get an all-around player, continue to compete every each and every day, just going to play winning basketball. I mean, sounds like typical cliche stuff, but you, you appreciate it. I mean, it, it, that stuff you have to say, but you appreciate it after having watched him play. And I've watched, I, I mentioned this, I was talking on Twitter. I probably, for all the teams ranked within the top 25 for the majority of the season that are, especially power five ones, uh, I've probably watched all of them play about 20 full games. I, I'm I'm an absolute uh, basketball content watching machine. And that's what I think my greatest strength is in draft evaluation is because I just am so familiar with the teams that they play. I know the context of how they play. So I think that's what I'm going to try to help you guys with right here is Keontae George played out of position. Like the first time I saw Keontae George play – in, in a level that I thought was respectable. I, I saw him play in high school, but I, I tend not to factor in too much into high school evaluation. Occasionally I will. Jamal, I mean, Jamal Murray was all I could think. Keontae George set the nets ablaze in the U23 games. He led a depleted Baylor squad, missing their second and third best players. And you can make an argument, Keontae was their second best player, and these guys could have been 1A, 1B ahead of him. Like Adam Flagler, unbelievable shooter. LJ Cryer, unbelievable shooter. Played the one and the two. Keontae George played the three. But anyway, he scored 32 and 37 points, respectively, in those games against U23, Canada, and Italy teams. And I was like, my God, this guy's Jamal Murray. Uh, I put him number six on my board right away. Like, I, no questions asked. Anyway, I recommend watching that if you guys haven't. But but the big thing that I, I mentioned at the start of that is context. He was playing point guard then. It made, made me think of him entirely differently than I did during the college season because the Jazz want him to be a point guard. You have to evaluate him as if you're evaluating a point guard. He played the three for Baylor because their backcourt was diminutive. Flagler and Cryer both 6'1 and 6'2. And uh, I think he added weight. I know I know he added weight. He, he weighed about 225 pounds during the regular season for Baylor. And then he sprained an ankle, which made him look almost like slow and sluggish toward in the last eight games of the season. If you look at his stats, they reflect that. I witnessed it in person twice at March Madness. I was in Denver with my friends. I was like, man, Keontae George looks terrible. And the one negative I would have had was he pouted a little bit. But, I mean, it's hard to judge a 19-year-old who's disappointed and not able to play at his best against good teams who are eager and desperate to win. Okay, Keontae George played good teams all season long. He played in the best conference in basketball. So there was a lot of players to pick from against who he could play. 
But I watched him play against Arkansas specifically so I could see him play against Anthony Black, who was selected sixth. And Jordan Walsh is regarded as one of the better defenders. He just has shooting deficiencies. He was selected in the early second round and came away just as impressed the second time as I did when I watched it when it happened. George had 24 points, three rebounds, three assists on eight of 20 shooting. Eh, it's okay. It's not great. But then you watch the game. Black started the game on George defensively. And then George quickly scored a left-hand layup. And a bit later, Walsh switched on to George. And the announcers immediately talked about how familiar they are with one another and quoted Walsh saying something to the effect of, I know how to guard him. You just get physical with him and you don't talk to him. And then Walsh blocked a jumper about a second later. I was like, wow, like that that's alarming. Jordan Walsh really, really did know what he was doing. And then the very next possession, one possession later, Keontae George hits a tough, tough step back three on the right wing, right in Walsh's grill. And that shows the shot-making prowess. Tough shot maker, shot, tough shot taker. You can pick which one you want to look at there. Maybe it was a bad shot, but he made it. It was, it was impressive. The shot creation against a very good defender who just gotten the better of him talks about the uh, the 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 bold nature in in order to to have the wild confidence to take that type of shot as a freshman and make that type of shot. I, I really respect respect that. That's something I admired about Jason Tatum. I didn't love Tatum's game at Duke. I mean, it was pretty, but I thought he took bad shots. But I, I kind of was like, you know what? The fact he can make these bad shots is something I need to look forward to. And I said the same about Ben Carroll. I'm not saying he's on the same caliber of those guys. This game was ugly but fun, by the way, between Arkansas and Baylor. These two went back and forth, showing good tape. Like, he went, he had some good tape, he had some bad tape. Where George really impressed me was he, he struggled for the majority of the game. Walsh and Black did a good job on him. He was 5 of 16. I mentioned he ended 8 of 20. So bear with me here. I'm going to break down a few possessions for you guys. And he was still relentless. And then the game was tight. It was it, at one point it was tied 53 to 53. And Baylor had their first lead since 27, 26 around this time. It was about, they took a lead about five points, five possessions prior to this. It's 53, 53. And then they put Anthony Black on him toward, for the end of the game. There's about four minutes left at this point. And Anthony Black starts denying him. Not a full on face guard deny, but, but enough of a denial. You know, that's the concerted effort to keep the ball out of number one's hands. Keontae George's hands. And then, Anthony Black is someone I've told you guys I thought might be the best guard defender in this class. So it's no slouch defending him. George then scored seven straight points going to the ball as the go-to guy in game 21 of his college career. He scored one going left around a great screen. The screen was what freed him up in this case. And he floated in from about 13 feet on the left elbow, just in front of the left elbow with his right hand. Then the next possession, same set where they've got a dribble handoff with Flo Thamba and the ball's in the hand of a guard. They hand it to Thamba, a little misdirection, and George walks up the right sideline uh, towards the ball and then cuts, and he's going left. He gets the ball, and he comes off the screen from Flo Thamba. He goes downhill hard, hits into the drop big, and he bangs into him, uses his shoulder to create some space, banks it off the glass. Tough shot. The, the floater was a, was a fairly routine one, but you still have to have the touch to make it. This one was a tough space creating one where he had to find the angle, the geometry to put this one off the glass and in. Baylor's now up five, uh, up four. They got back to back stops. Keontae George is hot. Anthony Black denies a little higher up on the screen. And then George walks his way up, finds the ball, comes off the screen left, cuts back, snakes it. For those of you who don't know what that means, that means he comes off the screen and goes backwards. So he like uses the screen and then uses creates another screen by going backwards, snakes it to his right and drains a three. And that's when the ball game was over. The resilience was needed to take these shots. He was a five of 60 entrance point, hit three straight, put the game away against a quality Arkansas team that made the sweet 16, eventually losing to the eventual national champions. And he did this in his 21st game after playing great defenders all day long. And though, and these guys, Walsh and Black, and then there was this another guy named Devo Davis, who was all SEC defense, all rotated onto him throughout the game. He showed a full repertoire in three possessions, scoring at all three levels. He scored from a three, he scored from the mid-range, and he got all the way to the rim and made a tough finish. Like, George played it at a higher weight, and maybe, maybe it made him slower, but you could see that there was enough burst to get past people, use the screens effectively, and he's got a silky smooth touch. And I mentioned he was the best shooter I saw in terms of the pro days. I, I came away more impressed watching this the second time than I did the first time live. And I remember saying, man, Walsh is playing great defense. Wow, what a shot, like audibly while watching this with a friend after we played basketball. Like I still remember that day. So I talked about this already. George shot the cover off the ball the, at the combine. The everydayers know this. I appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys for listening. But here's what that, this all shows me. 
George shows an ability to get off the ball and dish it at times. Uh, he, he's not an amazing passer yet, but you can see he's got the ability to see the floor, and it's about timing and repetition. And I think he's got a chance to use that and his scoring prowess to really draw the eyes of defenders and then create for others. I, I think in this system, it was a little bit my turn, your turn, egalitarian between three guards, but it's also harder to find assists when you're throwing to guards that like to dribble into their shots and Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer. And like, yes, he hits them for spot ups, but typically it's easier to find a big when you're a, a younger guard or a less experienced point guard and a creator. I think it's easier to find someone that is rolling as opposed to spotting up just because the percentages are, are higher. So it may have hindered his assist numbers. George defensively, I thought had some good, some bad. A lot of the issues were communication based. I think sometimes they were in a zone, a matchup zone. Other times they were switching everything. And most of my ones where I'd say, oh, that, that looks like an error, could be chalked up to miscommunication. I think it's a, this game wasn't particularly great to show the uh, defender is. You could see that Anthony Black and Jordan Walsh were better athletes than Keontae George, though, if that makes uh, any sense. That, that, that could talk about liabilities down the stretch uh, as someone who could be targeted should he get there. But there's a long way to go before being targeted in the NBA. you got to get yourself on the court. Overall, George impressed me with this game, both the first time and the second time, like I mentioned, and being able to find a shot against NBA caliber defenders, NBA caliber athletes, scoring 24 in a low scoring out. This is the game ended about 67 points for Baylor, and he scored 24 of them and seven straight clutch ones at the end. And I could see by watching this again, I could see what I saw seeing Jamal Murray, even though he was playing the three in this one and less on the ball. Coming up next, I'll tell you guys about Bryce Sensabaugh and how he played against Penn State 3 and D, Seth Lundy. But first, let me tell you about Murdoch Chevy. Murdoch Chevy. Murdoch's have been in Utah for over 80 years. Chevy is American. It's synonymous with America. If I think of American, I see a movie with a truck in it, which is, you know, what you see. I think of Chevy every single time. It's located in Woods Cross, Logan. And the great Chevy trucks are all around. you got the Colorado, the Silverado. And you can see all the greatest deals on the website. Every spec and factor about these trucks you can learn on the website and see the availability on the website the amazing lineup of the suvs the tahoe the suburban the blazer the equinox and the tracks they're all available on that website and they're also available and in stock at both the locations of woods cross and logan all righty welcome back into locked on jazz still leaf to lean here with you to break down the jazz's newest additions and right now it's bryce sensabaugh here's what justin zanuck said I didn't expect him to be here at 28. Zanuck laughed when talking about Sensabaugh, saying, when he started slipping a bit, at least in our rankings, we started to get a lot of calls trying to move in. He makes and takes tough pro shots, continuing to get better on the defensive end, but he's got a pro body. And then he said, the draft took a really fortunate turn for us. We're, we're leaning into talent, getting many talented players in the roster. And that's exactly what I think they did. The Jazz got three guys that rated at equal to or above where they were selected. They had Hendricks ninth on the board. They had George 10th on the board and they had uh, Sensabaugh at 18. They got him at 28, George at 16, and obviously Hendricks at nine equal to or, or better value than you're expecting. And then you talk about what they got. They got talent and shooting and youth. They're all 19 years old. Here's one for you. The best shooters in the draft. You could, you could make the argument. I think Jordan Hawkins, is the best shooter in the draft. I, I've said this before. I think Jet Howard, Grady Dick were commonly associated with the best shooting. Dariq Whitehead was one I'd throw a, I'd throw a hat into a ring and say he's up there. Sensabaugh is numerically ahead of all of those guys. So let's just say that's the top five. Kobe Brown, Brandon Miller, and Julian Strother are probably in that conversation that went in the first round. And George and Hendricks have every bit of a claim to be on that same par as those guys outside the top five while still being in the top ten. So the Jazz could have just gotten three 19-year-olds who scored 15 points per game or more as freshmen in good divisions in college basketball. And then they added three of the top eight shooters in the draft. Okay. That's pretty good. That's really good. All right. So Bryce Sensible, let me talk. I, I've mentioned this before. I think he's uh he reminds me a little bit of TJ Warren. He's got a little bit of a, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of bully ball score against you, but I've got the touch and the finesse uh, that that's, something I can accept a role and I'll be a spot up shooter, someone who can score at the NBA level. Defensively, there are a lot, there are concerns. Uh, there, the other concern with him would be the aside from the defense would be he had a dead leg kind of knee issue toward the end of the year where he struggled to 
to play the late later games. And Ohio State was also a bit of a dumpster fire, so that could have factored in. Now, what did I notice against Penn State? By the way, Seth Lundy was picked 46 as a 3 and D guy. Um, and so this is a good matchup. The reason I didn't choose Jet Howard is because Sensible and Jet mostly avoided each other, and I thought that would be uh, disingenuous to tell you guys how he did against an NBA player when they didn't really guard each other. So he had eight mid-range shots, uh, that, and one he drew foul on out of his out of his shot attempts. That's unlikely to be the diet of shots he's going to get in the NBA. You have to be a star. I mentioned this about Johnny Davis last year. I didn't love Johnny Davis's prospect because he didn't wow me athletically, and he was reliant on being stronger than guys. Sensible has that, but unlike Johnny Davis, he's a phenomenal shooter. His catch and shoots were bullseye. Like he, he was set, he was ready. It, he had two kind of like power three layups where he used his brawn and he made those and he reached through. And uh, he looked good. He, he didn't look super explosive. This is a later in the year game. The scouting reports are good. He's beaten up a little bit. And it wasn't a terrible defensive showing, but he was not impressive is what I'd say. Uh, his catch and shoot, it, the ball comes off his hand. It's not like a crazy quick release, but it's succinct and it's pure. That's it, really, really impressive. He'll be a catch and shoot guy in the NBA that I think can actually thrive in that capacity and has more capacity to score because he's demonstrated it before. Of the shots he would likely take in an, a, and make in an NBA game, he made most of them. Like, he he shot a number of shots. He went 8 of 14 in this game. And a lot of them were tough mid-range shots. There was, only, there was a couple where he ran off pin downs, got a mid-range jump shot. He got a catch and shoot, got a step-through layup, got a foul where he pump faked and drew fouls. Like, he shot some normal NBA shots, but a lot of them were a steady diet of mid-rangers. So, of the NBA ones he took, he made them at a very high clip. It's that you need to have a special role and or be a star to get the diet of shots that he took. And so that's the one thing I would hesitate to say about from this game, like the see the, to see the way he scores in a game where he scored 20 points is a little bit concerning, but, but he did it against an NBA defender and he was to the tune of eight of 14. That's, that's impressive. Bryce is good at coming off screens. He showed it this game. He's not the, like I said, not the quickest release, but a tight rotation and succinct, form catch and sh catch to the shoot catch to the shot i should say right the one thing i will mention from the negative perspective against uh, of this game sensible disappeared for a while in this game and it stopped hunting for a shot for a large time of time a large chunk of time uh between the early second half to i wouldn't say late in the second half but the middle of the second half there was like a 10 minute period where sensible was a non-factor and for someone who scored 20 points is the head honcho on a team. I know he's a freshman. I know there was, uh, you know, a little bit of difficulty in, at times in this Ohio State season because they were not very good. But that's something I don't want a guy with that much talent to not be shooting. That's the thing that impressed me about Keontae George is how he was still willing to shoot against all this concerted attention to di disrupt him. And he was still able to shoot and do so well when it mattered most. So Sensabaugh disappeared a little bit, but he was able to get some buckets at the end of the game. And it's a little disappointing, but I think it had to do with context of the team was not great. And they're playing against a team, Penn State, that made the made the round of 32 in, in college basketball tournament. And he was and they were very good. They were clicking at this time. So how does he fit in immediately? I think he will get a chance to play sparingly early on and may also be awesome in the summer league because typically shooting ability and the, the knack for scoring does shine through in the summer league because if you can score against all these athletes and you don't have to be reliant on your athleticism to do so, I've seen a lot of players thrive that way in the summer leagues before. And I'll be there. If you guys see me there, let me know, uh, For especially for those watching on YouTube because you'll know who I am. If not, I'll be wearing my credential and I'm happy to talk with you guys about the Jazz because, like I said, lifelong fan, all I want to see is us do great work in the offseason, get this team better and back competing in the playoffs in no time. And contending for real. Even if it's – I'd rather contend for real than be in the playoffs too soon. But I'd like both. Anyway, la last thing here about Sensabaugh. I think he could lose some weight, and I think that'll be a concerted effort for him. I think it'll be better for his knee, which is a concern. I think it'll be better for his defense. And he's also said he's become a far better defender uh, in some interviews. He said, you know what, I've, I've become a better defender since the season ended. And so that that's something that I, I want to see for myself, see if it's actually true or if it's just talk because, you know, it's people-pleasing. So uh, how can he get minutes this season? How do I expect him to do if he does? Well, I can see him shooting it well enough to earn consideration for the minutes because he will shoot well. He really is a very good shooter. You can make an argument for the best shooter in this class. 
Should he lose some weight and be decent defensively? I could see him getting uh, sparing, like not a lot of minutes, playing sparingly. Uh, and if the Jazz lose some of the logjam at guard, and, and we will talk about this at some point, uh, THT, Sexton, George, Akbaji, Chris Dunn, all those guys are playing, and they likely figure to play ahead of sensible. But I don't think all those guys necessarily will be back here. And then the priority has to be developing Ochai, I believe. So maybe the logjam is between the shooting guard position, which is what Sensabaugh figures to play, and THT and Sexton, I think, are more of shooting guards than point guards. So that is a logjam. I'll discuss how that can, can be affected coming, uh, coming up in the next episode. I think Sensabaugh has got a chance to play. He just needs that to be, you know, there needs to be a beaver chewing down that dam. Like he, he's got to find a way to, to find the court, but I think that it's got, it might have to be through friendly fire. Someone may have to be moved in order for Sensabaugh to have a chance. And maybe Sensabaugh thrives and develops in the G League and there's a slower chance. But I think with his shooting, he does have a chance to play, and I think he could star in the, uh, in the summer league doing so. So I'll discuss what to watch for in the Jazz's offseason in, in regard to Sexton, THT, and other players who could be joining the Jazz or on their way out with Andy Larson on the next episode of Locked on Jazz. So all you everydayers, look forward to that. And we'll also talk about the draft. As Andy really wanted Taylor Hendricks, he's got Taylor Hendricks. We'll see what we learn about Taylor Hendricks in some interviews. In the meantime, that will transpire between when you hear this and when that one's coming out. And as always, tune into Locked on Jazz, and thank you very much for making that your first edition. But keep educating yourself about the draft, stuff happening in the summer league. And, and I recommend, if this is your first listen, which thank you for that, tune in for, to Rafael Barlow, Richard Stamen, who were at the draft, and see what they cooked up as draft reactions for your second listen. Have a lovely day, and as always, go Jazz!